I don't know who ordered the weather, but thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, how many of you have never heard these two gentlemen speak before? Wow. That's why the crowd's so big. <laughs> well, vegetable gardening season, we're all ready for spring after this winter, and we couldn't be more honored to have these two gentlemen with us here today. We have Tom Leroy, who is, yes, <laughs> a fan, you have a fan, uh, the uh, agent emeritus from Montgomery County, but you can keep in touch with Tom now through his website, gardeningwithtomleroy.com, and I believe we link to him through arborgate.com, uh, and Mr. Bill Adams, who was the agent for Harris County. Together, they wrote this wonderful book, and any of you that garden need to have this book. If you don't have it, we have copies available, and I'm sure they would be happy to sign one for you after the class. But this absolutely is the book you need. Also, by Mr. Adams, you tomato lovers, tomato aficionados, this is your guide. And the book of lists, which we use all the time, will get you great information on problem areas or just solving what to plant where. So perfect book. Um, we're also going to do something a little bit fun today. Our, I don't know if any of you are aware, but we do a podcast now. So after the class, we're going to take about a 10-minute break. If you would like to come back and ask these two gentlemen, they have agreed to answer your questions and then we're going to record it for the podcast for March. So your, your chance for fame and fortune. <laughs> so, again, thank you both so much for being here with us today and thank you all for coming out today. You on? Uh, can you hear me now? She can hear me. I don't know about... I'm Joyce. Uh, we're trying to raise blueberries and we put them in uh, with azalea soil and have used sulfur and pine straw and we still have a pH of 6.8 and we're trying to how do we lower the, the pH? Well sulfur is still probably the best approach uh, also peat moss is a good approach but that's usually done at the beginning prior to planting. What you need to do is just continue to put on light amounts of of garden sulfur. I would get the finely pulverized sulfur rather than the pelleted sulfur and then wait a, put a small amount on and then wait about three or four months for it to react and then get your pH tested again. And what you want to do is you want to force it down slowly rather than trying to get it all down too quickly or you'll actually break the buffering cap capacity of the soil and it'll mess things up. So do it very, very slowly. The plants will put up with you for a while. You may also foliar feed your plants with iron while you're working on getting the soil down. You can get a sequestering iron or a chelated iron to spray them with. Did you have any other things, Bill? I've never lived anywhere I could grow blueberries. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill Any clay soils don't, don't do well. With Bill lives over in the, in the Blackland areas where, where blueberries are such a big problem. But... Uh, but you're just going to need to push that thing down very slowly. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Any others? Hi, I'm Chris. I'm building a house right now that's going to be on a well. Are there any concerns with well water? Or I'm also putting my house on a water softener. Which should my uh, nearest faucet for my garden be on? Well, the, uh, there's sometimes quite a bit of calcium in well water. That's something you can probably get checked fairly easily. You can get an irrigation quality analysis through Texas A&M soil testing lab. Uh, but the uh, the sodium is what you want to keep out of your, your garden. So if you're doing a softener, uh, you want to make sure that it's only going into the house and not on your outside faucets that you might be using for the garden or orchard. So. And if we do have some people that have water softeners that they, because of the way they're installed, that you, you can't take uh, take the water off before the softener. You'll need to change out to the potassium salts instead of the instead of the sodium salts with your softener because potassium is a natural fertilizer. It's a fertilizer that we use quite often anyway. So that would be one approach if you can't get around that, but it'd be best to get around it. Any other? Hi, my name is Kathy. Um, 
me and my daughter-in-law, we are going to, we want to start a raised bed garden. And I guess our question is, is how deep do we need to make it? And what kind of soil do we need to start with? And what kind of plants? Really, what is the easiest thing for us to start with? Go ahead. Uh, my raised beds are, are built with tube of twelves. And uh, we used a, a mostly bank sand mixture with, with mushroom compost blended in about a third to start with. Uh, I have to add more organic matter every year because uh, it just oxidizes, breaks down over time. So I keep adding mushroom compost kind of as a top dressing to those beds. Haven't added any more sand or anything. Uh, there are soil mixes that you can purchase, uh, but I'd go have a look at them first to make sure it's not too much uh, wood chips or something mixed in with it. Uh, we grew a lot of vegetables in six beds. Uh, we had uh, a few tomatoes. We eventually expanded because we needed more room for okra and, and more tomatoes and some sweet corn and, and things like that. But all the things that are fairly intensive production, green beans, uh, we had a little trellis, we had sugar snap peas in the cool season, uh, pole beans other times, cucumbers at times. So you'd be amazed at how much that you can grow in raised beds because it is intensive and it's uh, a little easier to manage, I guess. You're out there a lot and you see a weed, you pull a weed, you know, yeah. and keep it going that way. And I think that uh, the potatoes are uh, are something that is pretty easy to grow. Uh, not a lot of pest problems. They usually produce in spite of us. And the small fruited peppers. Uh, bell peppers are a little bit more challenging, but uh, any of the small fruited sweet peppers or hot peppers are usually pretty cooperative and can be grown pretty easy by a new gardener. Um, I heard you earlier talking about the newspapers, you know, should we put something like that on the bottom of our, uh, the boxes that we're going to be making? You can absolutely do that and you can even lap that up a little bit on the wood so that it keeps, uh, you know, the uh, soil from going out till it's settled. It will eventually mm -hmm. settle in there. Um, it will keep some of the weeds down for a while. Others like nutgrass are more persistent. They may show up eventually. Uh, but as long as you don't start out with nutgrass in your soil mix, I think you'll be off to a good start. Okay. And, and then if you if if you have a Bermuda grass yard, uh, I would either dig the Bermuda grass or kill the Bermuda grass with a herbicide like Roundup before putting the boxes in. Because if you're if you're putting newspaper down on a St. Augustine yard, that'll probably keep the St. Augustine from coming through. But Bermuda will grow through a foot of soil without any problem at all. Okay, so the uh, organic material that you're talking about the mushroom is that what you're talking about mushroom about? Compo compost or one of the blends that okay. already has compost mixed with it okay thank you very much mm -hmm. here's your chance to be a star <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe and my question is what's the best um, organic treatment for leaf legged stink bugs or leaf leg bugs leaf footed bugs leaf footed yeah best organic treatment well I have kind of run them off with with neem oil uh, you go out there when they're most prevalent it's kind of the middle of the day you'll probably have a lot of them out there and they don't seem to like being sprayed with that I think insecticidal soap would do a, a similar thing if you want to you can plant some cherry tomatoes for a trap crop I mean, they love cherry tomatoes. Uh, they'll find sun golds uh, from, from any place, you know. Uh, of course, you've got to spray those trap crops with something that's labeled on whatever the trap crop is. I mean, you, you don't want to nuke them with something that, that's not labeled on tomatoes and follow whatever the harvest interval is before you can pick them, for that matter. But that would possibly tend to concentrate them, maybe keep them off of some of your other planting. And, and most of the commercial growers are using the synthetic pyrethroids but you could use the organic pyrethroids. There are a number of co companies that sell organic pyrethrum, and uh, it's not quite as hot as the synthetic ones, but it does a pretty good job. One thing that I did the last two years, I purchased a, uh, a uh, cordless rechargeable vacuum for use in vacuuming out the car. And every morning before I went to work or ran errands or whatever, I'd go out there and just suck all those babies up and I tell you, that's the best control I've had in a in several years. And so I think it's uh, it's one you might think if you got the time, it's one you might look at. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Jessica, and my question is, we generally buy seed packets, and then the seeds that we don't plant in this year's garden, we try to hold over for next year. But we have found that if you save a packet or don't even open a packet and try to use it the next year, the seeds won't sprout. And we're trying to figure out, are we storing them incorrectly? Why would that be? You, uh, well, I don't know anything about not opening the packet that would make them not germinate, but there is no question that different plants have uh, store shorter periods of time than others. A uh, sweet corn has a very short shelf life. Carrots and, and lettuce has a very short shelf life. I've had tomato seeds come up after 10 years. The best thing I can suggest to you for storage is sealed containers, you know, Ziploc bags, uh, plastic wear containers, as dry as possible. I like to put those silica gel packets that come with mm -hmm. electronics or whatever in there with them to suck up the extra moisture and in the refrigerator, in the refrigerator. not the freezer. Mm -hmm. well, they Really most commercial seed storage facilities keep it at about 30 degrees. And you say, well, that's freezing, but your freezer is probably eight degrees. Mm -hmm. And so that's much too cold. So refrigerator would be a better place. Yeah, Thank the seeds have to be much. really dry. Yes. To yeah. store them in the freezer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Walk over to the microphone and they'll they'll put you on. Hey, thank you for uh, coming out and spending your morning with us this Saturday. Uh, I just started, uh, and I want to know how much and how often to feed and water my garden. It's hard to come up with an exact quantity uh, to water, but uh, it. it that involves spending some time there so that you know. I mean, you, when you begin to see plants start to flag a little bit, that means that you really need to get the water out there because you don't want them to really go down because sometimes, for one thing, they may reach a permanent wilting point and not come back. Uh, but I think you just learn that as you work with the garden. I mean, there's some raised beds that, especially to start with, I'm watering every day or every other day and yet later in the season uh, I may not have to water them. If I get a nice rain, well I know I've probably got a two or three day span that I can kind of hold off on. Uh, low volume irrigation systems, a little drip systems or micro sprinklers or something like that can really help. You can even put those on time clocks and in that case you might do every other day for four hours or something okay. and that, that may work. But then you've got to check the garden to make sure you're not puddling someplace and running dry in other places. And, some of the tape products or the, the tubing products may be uneven as far as the way they dis distribute water. So uh, I found that the little micro sprayer or shrubbers that you poke right into the half inch poly work real well to water between plants, say between tomato plants. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and you can, uh, you can kind of go by the way they look. If you go out to the garden in the afternoon and they're, as Bill says, flagging, they're wilted, then you probably need to water tomorrow. Um, so the plants are a real good indicator. You don't want them stressing. That That's going to cause poor flavor, poor production. So you want to keep them from, from wanting. And they can stress from too much water too. You know, if they don't have oxygen in the soil, if it's waterlogged, then you'll get the same wilting response. Say we have a 10 inch rain. You'll get the same wilting response as if it's dry. And it may be terminal. Hey, I'm Gary. Cutworms. I'm tired of feeding them for the pumpkins and the squash and the watermelon. What do you recommend? We we took one gallon buckets. We kind of cut the bottom out and we put the seeds with. The, we let the color of the pot up maybe three or four inches. Is there anything else you recommend so I don't have to feed those guys anymore? There, there's a number of soil uh, products. Uh, almost any of the the insecticides that are for soil treatment for grubs and and things like that that can be put down pre-plant before you plant your seeds. Most of them contain a pyrethroid. Uh, there are also seven is seven is still probably one of the best products. There are several seven baits out there. They're a carbamate bait that are specifically designed for uh, for cutworms uh, that can be used as well. I think uh, you've suggested uh, uh, wrapping the, the the bases with foil in the past. And foil. The problem with the insecticides is you may get some of the general population, but they don't eat enough of it at one time to not get your tomato plant uh, before they die. So, you know, that's why the, the mechanical barrier, uh, either a little piece of tin foil around your tomato
tomato plant a little under the soil an inch or so above the soil works well or you use cardboard and just staple that around the plant. I mean there's physical ways to keep them from the plant with squash and things like that I guess it's it's maybe a little more difficult to and summer tilling can help uh, you know there's soil insect and uh, you come in and you till your soil and expose the insects allow the birds and other wildlife to come in and they'll they'll feed up on that stuff and then you know in a few weeks give it another tilling and repeated summer tilling sometimes can get can help reduce a, a number of different problems that yeah, we even have nematodes is the so-called dry tilling uh, in the summer after your through with your uh, tomato crop will expose nematodes to dry conditions and that reduces numbers. That's exactly right. Till them up and ring the din dinner bell. That's exactly yeah. right. Yep. Thank you. Um, last year I had a problem with the squash vine borer <laughs> and I read that uh, you could, I guess that they're only present for about maybe a month, like in the month of June. That I read, I don't know, and that you can you can try to cover them to prevent them from infecting the plant. Um, that seems like that would be kind of difficult to do. Um, I was looking for something that would be organic because I do have chickens in my garden, so I want something that would be safe to that I could use um, with them around for when I plant squash this year. Uh, you can encourage the stems to root by mounding a little soil on the stems as they grow along, and that will help. Uh, they just kind of outgrow the vine borers. Some varieties are really vigorous, and they tend to do that anyway. Um, if you see the adults coming in, they look like these little orange and black moths. Why, you can mechanically take care of them one way or another, swat them or, or something, I guess. Uh, if you see the, the frass, the material where they've chewed on the stem, take your pocket knife and go in there, you know, one puncture, and that's pretty... They don't develop resistance to that, but it is a, you couldn't do it on 40 acres very well. So, uh, I, I don't know, Tom, you got any other ideas? Well, I think one of the problems with a, a general statement of they're active in June is, is one of the problems with that is, is that in Minnesota or is that in, in Florida, you know? I mean, every different climate is going to be a different time. So I don't know that you can go with a month. You know, Bill and I have covered squash to control thrips, but, but thrips are a problem early in the season before they start to bloom and it really works very, very well. But you take the cover off when, as soon as they start to flower because you gotta have all the insects in there to pollinate them. I have had really good, it, probably one of the best lucks with BT. Uh, they're a moth, and so the, the grub is a caterpillar. The problem with BT is that you're putting BT on the surface of the vine, and the only time you can catch them is when they hatch out of the egg and bore into the vine. Because once they're in the vine, they're protected. So that means spraying every two days or so with BT and you have to apply it just to the vine and spray underneath because I've seen them go in the garden and they'll lay their eggs on the underside of the vine and uh, so get try to get it under the vine as well. Plant more squash than you want um, because uh, they're going to get some of them and uh, you know so uh, the problem we've always had is where we plant large amounts of squash is who are you going to give all the squash to yeah, you can overproduce for a while, but I've, I've seen uh, plants uh, get virus and, and even uh, have vine borers in the fall, so apparently they didn't get the June uh, message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd try BT. That's probably your best approach. Hello. Hello. I have um, a chicken coop, and I want to be the lazy gardener and be able to go straight from the coop into the garden. What can I use as a bed? I knew a guy. I knew a guy who had a movable chicken coop, and he just would uh, let the chickens feed and and everything for a while in this spot, and then he'd move the chicken coop and he'd plant his garden right where the chickens. Oh, that's a chicken tractor, right? Is that a chicken tractor? I can see. <laughs> yeah. Are you worried about using the fertilizer too well, soon? Well, right now I'm using hay, and uh -huh. he was saying not to use hay directly in the garden because of the not to mix it in the garden. You can yes. use it to mulch with. Yeah, absolutely. It's great mulch. So what should I use instead? Can I use newspaper, or is there anything else that can go directly from the coop into the garden? Oh, uh, you could put the chickens on a on a screen, and a screen. and that way the the, the shavings would fall. Th I mean, the uh, the manure would fall through the screen. Okay. But but 
you know, the animal rights people might come after you because <laughs> they're having to walk on an unnatural surface. I don't know, but in, <laughs> I know they do that in commercial chicken and chicken hatcheries. Is okay. they they actually have them walking on a on a screen and then the manure falls underneath them. It might be if if you're worried about the garden though and the, and the material being fairly fresh. If you had a layer of newspaper uh, between the rows, so that when you brought the manure or the mixture, whatever comes out uh, from the bottom that it wouldn't have as immediate a contact with the plant roots, have a little more time to break down. Okay, thank It might you. be a good idea. Yeah. Um, it was about, uh, what, what do you recommend for companion planting to deter pests like aphids? And I've always been told that marigolds are good to plant, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but, um, but I always have problems with aphids and um, white flies and those types of bugs. I don't know that anybody has ever demonstrated scientifically that companion planting works. It sounds good and I companion plant more to get more out of the garden than anything. And uh, there, there are definitely some plants that are allelopathic that get off, give off substances from the roots that would inhibit the growth of other plants, black walnut trees. And, and a lot of weeds yeah. are very successful at inhibiting plants growing around them but that's not being a good companion. So uh, may, maybe they're more likely to be bad companions than good companions. I don't know if that really works. And, and, and most all of the things that you plant to deter a pest has a pest. Uh, marigolds, they use marigolds quite often for nematodes. But the, the problem with that is that marigolds are very susceptible to spider mites. So then instead of having nematodes on your tomatoes, you have spider mites on your tomatoes. And the other, we actually, I think uh, one of Bill's predecessors did a big trial, this has probably been 40 years ago, on marigolds. And he found that if you planted the entire garden to marigolds. Around the turn of the century. Yeah, around the turn of the century, that's right. <laughs> planted it to marigolds and then plowed the marigolds under and let them decompose. And you got to buy the old-fashioned marigolds because, see, they've been breeding the stink out of marigolds. And you want the old stinky ones because that had the good stuff in it plow it under and let it decompose that really helped a great deal with de with deterring nematodes but if you if you put a, a ring around your tomato with marigolds then really all you've done is trap the nematodes in they can't get out anymore they because the so so uh, it's it's really hard to prove companion planting i plant diverse because i i just think it, it does like bill says increases production um allows you to plant a lot of different stuff through the gardening season because you know you may not be ready to pull your broccoli yet but that doesn't mean you wouldn't stick a tomato plant in, in amongst the broccoli with the idea that by the time I get ready to pull my broccoli plants the tomatoes will have grown up a bit and and, I'll, and, and they'll need to get the broccoli out of there so that's not really companion planting it's I don't know, use and I've space. seen some recommendations like planting garlic with your tomatoes but garlic grows in the fall and winter and the tomatoes grow in the summer so that might work in a, a northern garden but it it wouldn't work here, and, and I'm even suspicious that it's not that effective. And and garlic gets uh, thrips real bad too. Yeah. 